April 22nd with our special guest, Amherst Sustainability Coordinator, Stephanie Ciccarello. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Bree. Happy to and, be here. And happy Earth Day to everybody and to both of you. Happy Earth Day. This is like Stephanie's number one holiday of the yes. year, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, we appreciate you joining us today. Um, in a moment, we are going to ask you to introduce yourself. Um, and but before we do that, we're going to have Paul give any general town updates he might want to share. Sure. Thanks. And thanks for being here, Stephanie. And happy Earth Day to everyone. This, so this, if this is your star turn um, in, in about 10 days, we're going to have the star turn for our finance department because that's when we deliver the town's annual budget, which includes the capital improvement program. And so that will be delivered to the town council on May 3rd uh, with a um, exciting new presentation, exciting new budget format, all kinds of things happening under our new finance director, Sean Mangano, which is very exciting. Um, it's been a lot of work by a lot of people to get to this point. Um, some you know, we're, we're still a lot of work to be done, and Brianna's aware of that is is part part and parcel of, of pulling this all together over the next uh, ten days, basically. So that's going to be the big thing that we're focused on over the next um, week and a half. And um, once that gets delivered to the town council, it moves to the finance committee, uh, and they go through pretty much twice a week meetings to go through department by department every um, recommendation or. Um, and then they make a recommendation to the full town council, which in June will take it under consideration and um, they need to approve a budget, a balanced budget uh, by June 30th. So that's that's the plan of action for that. And that's so that's taking up a lot of our time, among other things that are happening. All right. Thanks for the updates, Paul. I would love for Stephanie to introduce herself to our audience, if you would. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ciccarello. I'm the sustainability coordinator for the town of Amherst, and I'm housed in the conservation department. And how long have you worked for the town? If you if you feel like divulging that. If you want more. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> technically, I've worked for the town for going on 24 years now, but um, officially 21. It'll be 21 in, Jan in July, July 1st. And why, what, why officially 21 and not 24? Was there a... Oh, oh, that's a long... <laughs> my, I had quite an interesting um, entryway into working for the, for the town. I started um, very part-time inspecting silt fences for uh, construction projects that the Conservation Commission was overseeing. I had been working for a wetland consulting firm and it was during one of the economic downturns. So there was a real lapse in um, building and construction projects. So I was actually laid off along with a senior staff person from the firm I was working for. And uh, this was just one of those opportunities that presented itself to at least have some part-time work. And I was a consultant at the time. So that's why those three years, those first three years are kind of as a consultant. Um, and I started inspecting the silt fences five to 10 hours and that led to attending conservation commission meetings, which then started to lead to more hours, you know, to 15 hours and then ultimately to 18 hours. And I was there for a while. Um, and at 20 hours, I was made a permanent part-time employee, but that was sort of a few years in. Um, so actually that those first three years. So I was a consultant uh, and then we created the position of wetlands administrator. There had been an assistant conservation director but they eliminated that position. Um, and so there was really only a conservation director and staff, a land manager and then the wetlands administrator position was created at that time. But that it's doesn't a, say how I got to here. <laughs> no, but it's always interesting to hear how the people's pathway into local government, which is something you know Brianna and I talk about, and she she's been very involved in encouraging people to, to seek a career in, in local government, and it and people come in it in different ways, you know. And yours came in it. it that's a it's a really interesting path through, through the consulting world to to part time work because of economic necessity. Then it, you proved yourself and grew into a bigger role. That's really interesting. Right. Yeah. It was, um, you know, I really, I didn't apply for <laughs> technically at least coming in, I didn't apply for a job with the town. That just mm -hmm. was sort of a, you know, inspe inspecting silt fences was not something that was being advertised at the time, especially back then. It's not something you would have advertised for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, who do you know that can do this? And so I was available and I said, sure, I'm happy to. Um, 
but it did grow into a role. And, and then um, from that role, we had an intern. There was a program that the then director, Pete Westover, had participated in from an organization called ICLE, which was the um, Cities for Climate Protection Program. And so we brought in an intern to do a baseline greenhouse gas emissions analysis. And when she was done, it just kind of left the town with starting this process that wasn't going to necessarily move forward. So I asked if there was a way I could have a role in helping with that. And then we created the um, position of energy task force uh, coordinator, because at the time, this intern had created an energy task force, force to work on the issue. But then she left and there was this group of people with no one to sort of work with them. So I stepped into that role. So then we created another position <laughs> that was, but this was all part time. I was for both positions. I was only part time, like at 24 to 28 hours per week doing both for about nine years or so. And how did that transition into what your current role is? And in- and can you describe a little bit about, I know it's a lot of things, but is there a little description you can give about what your current role is and does? Um, well, the sustainability coordinator position evolved um, because we had developed that cl- a climate action plan, that energy task force group had created a climate action plan that was released back in 2005. And so I was, I was sort of supporting that work um, very part-time, but um, over time there became more opportunities within, uh, at the state level actually, and even at the federal level, uh, to do more work addressing climate change. And climate change sort of at the beginning, this was kind of at the earlier, earlier part of people's awareness around this issue, you know, around 2000 was kind of when there was a real sort of shift, I think, in, in awareness and public awareness and um, that's when people started seeing all the images of the polar bears and, you know, there was just a, a definite um, movement that, that began at that time. So um, there was more opportunity to start working in this field. And once we created the Climate Action Plan, it identified the need for a role to sort of work on this issue, like a very a separate staff position. And well, honestly, at the time, it was a very aspirational thing to include. We didn't really think it would ever happen. But around 2012, the town um, decided to participate in the Green Communities Program. And that really required a real focus on um, addressing climate change through energy efficiency measures and things that we could do on the municipal side. And it was going to, it was just going to require more hours. And at the time I was, uh, the wetlands administrator position had fully evolved into supporting the conservation commission. We had other staff at one time that had been doing things like taking minutes. Um, but that, uh, position basically went away or evolved so that it wasn't doing that supportive role for the commission any longer. So the wetlands administrator took that on. So it was just so much, it was just too much to be able to do both jobs. So we kind of cleaved them off and create, you know, created the wetlands administrator as a separate job and, and the sustainability coordinator job evolved out of the need for participating in green communities. I'm going to take a a quick moment for those of us who are watching us on Facebook live, feel free to drop a comment and we can um, ask your question to to Stephanie or to Paul, um, as well as those joining us live in Zoom, feel free to pop your question into the Q&A or raise your hand so we can hear from you live. We'd love to um, be able to invite you into the room. So you talked about your trajectory and how that kind of built up, but um, in the, in the last few years, there's been you know a lot of developments in this field and how, how has the focus of your work changed over time, or especially recently, uh, over the last few years, are you seeing different trends, different areas to focus on? I think there's a lot of things that I've seen. Uh, the shift, as I said, was really in the beginning, there was just this kind of baseline level awareness of climate change. And I think there was a period of time where people were talking specifically about climate change and it became very overwhelming. And um, I think people felt like there, it was so it was so much that they didn't know what to do with it. And I think there was a shift at the state level with the Green Communities Program and how we present this. Um, And so it became uh, an alternative view, uh, uh, an alternative way of looking at it through efficiency 
um, as something like that's a win-win, right? So if you're if you're becoming more efficient with your energy use, you're basically helping to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. I mean, that's kind of one of the pathways of getting there. So you're still doing that, but you're not calling it, you know, addressing climate change. You're more focusing on it as energy efficiency. And so it was a more positive spin on it that made it, I think, a lot more palatable for communities to get on board so that they could do the things they needed to do to address climate change, but sort of do it through the lens of efficiency in a way that felt easier. It was kind of an easier sell, if you will. Um, and it saved money. So those efficiency measures saved money. So it was just a really, um, I, I think a really brilliant strategy on, at the state level to really find a way to present this. And so the, the focus was shifted, but I think we're getting back more now to really talking about climate change as the real issue because we are at such a tipping point. And the worst case scenarios that we used to see presented, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we're actually heading in that, in that, on that trajectory. You know, there were, at the beginning, it used to be sort of, you know, the, you know, the most that we can do to address this, this is where we'll be, the least we can do, we'll be here, you know, and, and we are following the sort of the worst trajectory, unfortunately. So I think when people call it a climate emergency now, like we've, we've moved beyond climate change. We're talking about climate emergency now. And that's really the level we're at. And we really need to look at it and focus on it at, at that level. And so, you know, with, with the change in form of government um, in the last couple of years here in Amherst and in, in the new committee, uh, the Energy and Climate Action Committee, ECAC for for all of you who are in the uh, in the, the acronym acronym know. Can you talk a little bit about your you're the staff liaison for the ECAC? Um, can you talk a little bit about what that the role of that committee is and some of the initiatives that um, that they're handling right now? Sure. So that committee was formed through the um, through our new town council, and their um, their focus is really to address climate change and reducing uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And there's also an element of resilience that they're they're looking at as part of their, their work as well. Um, they've done quite a bit of work just in the last couple of years in which they convened where they're trying to do some real um, broad community outreach to really get a sense of where people stand, you know, on this issue, what they're aware of, what their concerns are, where what they'd like to see happen. So they did a lot of polling and outreach at the beginning, and now they're um, working with town with the town on developing uh, a climate action plan. We hired a consultant, Linnaean Solutions, out of Cambridge, Mass, who um, has been a great partner, and we've been working with them for just about a year now on um, on developing this climate action plan. So. We had a very interesting process for that, um, that the committee was very much behind in terms of really engaging people and community members that typically aren't at the table. And we did a real concerted effort to, to bring people in to have a voice in our, um, what we call task group sessions. We looked at specific sectors of the town in terms of transportation, um, renewable energy, land use. Um, and we, we had specific groups that gathered on those specific topics and people really had an opportunity to, to have a voice and to um, talk about, you know, the things that were most concerning to them in, in relation to climate change in those given sectors. I was impressed by that the kind of purposeful outreach you did to look at who's not at the table at these discussions, because we have a very in, engaged um, community, um, but it's usually the same groups of people and the people who don't have time or don't come to meetings. And I think that your group, especially Lene, and I think we learned from Healthy Hampshire about how good things you went to those meetings, you saw, wow, they had a really diverse group of people. And I know our staff, when they would go to these meetings, well, would say, these are folks I've never seen at a public meeting before, and it's exactly what was needed for this plan. So I thought that the thoughtfulness that you brought to that and that ECAC um, said was a value, was really important um, to the end product that, that you're going to be releasing pretty soon, right? Yes, um, it should be completed by the end of June. We'll probably release it, you know, when we presented to the council will probably be like the the official release and that will be sometime towards the end of June. 
What was the thing that surprised you mo most about that process in relation to what you learned from community members and, and engaging new audiences? Was there a, a, a key takeaway there that kind of impacted you? I, I just think um, really how much um, it takes to really engage members of the community you know, the way that things have traditionally been done um, through no fault of anyone's really, it's just sort of a, a systemic issue, right? How we have meetings, when we have meetings, where we have meetings, um, you know, you, you sort of get into a, a, a sort of pattern of doing things and you don't realize how exclusive it is, right? Because it's just the way, well, you always have meetings at night and we always have them at town hall and that's just how it is. Uh -huh but it excludes so many people. And I think going to that, those meetings, it was really the meetings through the Collaborative's Healthy Hampshire Initiative that was just like a life altering experience for me. I, I commend them so much on the work that they do. And I also am so thankful that I had that opportunity to participate in that process. The meetings were in, um, held at noon. They were held in a church basement there was food provided um, and people were so engaged and there were people who, um, you know, uh, there were, you know, sort of, there was English translation at the meeting. So there were people who didn't speak English at all. Um, and that was kind of great to be able to be in that situation where I was trying to engage with people where we didn't speak the same language, but somehow we were able to communicate with one another. Um, I really, I just really valued that experience. And it just, but like I said, it was very life altering. Oh, sorry, my, my audio fell off for a second there. Um, one thing that we talked about a little earlier, Stephanie, was, you know, we have the Energy Climate Action Committee, which is comprised of um, mostly community members. And I believe some counselors are on that as well. Um, that's one way to get involved. What, what can other people do to get involved in climate action here in Amherst on the local level? Do you have any suggestions? Um, well, I do. I think there's, you know, there's, there's so many opportunities. I think we're in an area where there's kind of, there's like an overabundance of choice of how you can get involved. Um, but there are certainly organizations um, like um, Mothers Out Front is one of the leading organizations in our area. There's a very organized group of moms and also I believe some men are involved as well um, who are really are, are really taking the mantle of this at the community level. And they've partnered with the town on several initiatives. And I would say that that's definitely one way people can get involved. Um, I think even people attending ECAC meetings Right now they're virtual, sit in on an ECAC meeting. I think there's gonna be opportunities um, in the future, especially as we, once we start to implement the climate action plan, one of the things that really has to happen is, you know, um, residents really have to sort of take on and embrace um, their role in uh, addressing this issue of climate change. And I think that's something that, you know, there'll be opportunities as this moves forward and the plan is unveiled and programs are unveiled. I think there'll be opportunities for people to get involved at that level. I could see, for, for instance, one example uh, might be at some point, we'll probably do some programming around um, uh, air source heat pumps, where we'll probably advocate for residents to install air source heat pumps. And that might be very, that might look very similar to the Solarize campaign that we did a few years back, where we had a team of residents that really kind of were the ones that went out and did the advocate, advocating for it, um, did signing up, you know, helping people get engaged in, in how they could sort of follow up and install solar. So we'll probably do something similar to, to that kind of initiative. And I would say there'll be opportunities like that moving forward. And is that all part of, you know, you're thinking about what the town is going to be doing in the next uh, five years or 10 years. Is that really part of that climate action and resilience plan that you were speaking about earlier that's coming in June? Will that be a roadmap for the town on how how they should move forward with the work? There's a section of it that's, you know, so the, the town council 
past three goals, if you will. The first one is to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions 25% by 2025. Then to reduce them by 50% by 2030, and then ultimately to be carbon neutral by 2050. Those are very lofty goals. So our plan can't, it, we don't know what's on the horizon in terms of what kind of technology or opportunity will lend itself. So it's hard to go all the way to 2050 with a roadmap. So we really kind of have focused on the roadmap piece of this being to 2025. And the rest of it is just sort of bigger aspirational suggested things that the town should do um, in terms of policy, in terms of um, advocacy, in terms of like some practical things we might be able to do down the road. So the roadmap is to 2025, but the rest of it is really sort of like, here are a list of all these other things we wanna look at. And then as we move forward, um, you know, we'll come back to this and we'll, you know, maybe create another roadmap um, as we go forward. It's kind of hard to tell that far, far ahead. Right. I think folks in the audience, if they, they, if they have questions, no, oh, good, already do. <laughs> it could be this or anything, all right? Yep. So we, we do have a hand anything. in the room. So oh, Ken, if, Ken, if you could um, unmute and introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live on Sunset Avenue. Stephanie, I think what you're doing is terrific. It's so important for us now and for the future. And I think we should all be grateful. I may be wrong, but I think that in the Healthy Hampshire Initiative, I don't think I've seen uh, the named participation from the University of Massachusetts. Uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me. If I'm right, what I would really like to ask you is, uh, since it's such a major player uh, economically and with its assets and resources and with its activity and commuters in this, in this area, how are you engaging them in the work you're doing? Thank you, that's a great question, Ken. And, and thank you for the compliments, I appreciate them. Um, so UMass is, um, has developed their own climate action plan, but we do have uh, representation from the university on the Energy and Climate Action Committee. So there is a liaison. It's not specifically um, that what we're doing um, with the ECAC is directly partnered with the university, but there is that um, connectivity, if you will, so that um, so that there can be more dialogue. Um, I, I do work with um, Ezra Small, who is their sort of equivalent, my position uh, at the university level. And we are partnering on like, for instance, the, um, the Valley Bike Program is something that the university partnered with the town on. So, um, so there are sort of individual um, initiatives that we pursue together, but I think in terms of the, you know, the um, specific goal of reducing carbon dioxide emissions, they're sort of developing their own plan, and I think ours will reference that. And I think once our plan comes out, there may be um, more opportunity to do more together. I think we, you know, once our plan is unveiled and once we have an opportunity to have them take a look at it, there can be more dialogue around some of those things. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ken, for your question. And I think something that kind of relates to that is, you know, you know, what, what are other surrounding communities around Amherst doing? Are we on par with them? Are we um, ahead of them? And are there regional collaborations that, you know, especially in Western Mass, it's important to have those collaborations. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of that? Sure, sure. So, um, so we are, um, Amherst is a member of a network called the New England Municipal Sustainability Network. And Northampton is also uh, a partner, uh, a collaborator and a uh, member of that group. And so that group has given an opportunity for us to, to sort of be around the table where everyone is sharing ideas about what they're doing at the municipal level. And um, we share our challenges, we share our aspirations, we share initiatives. And so we've been able to um, have conversations like, again, to bring up Valley Bike, but it really is one of the greatest examples that um, sort of evolved from a car ride to one of our um, NEMS network meetings. So 
Wayne Fiden, who's the planning director, and Chris Mason, who's the energy officer for Northampton, and I were together and just talking. And we both identified that having a bike share program was something we both wanted to sort of uh, advocate for within our communities. But it was so um, difficult and challenging to do. And then we said, well, what if we try to do this together? And then it just sort of evolved into this bigger effort. Um, it's huge. It, and it, now it's really huge. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the game changer for that, that was so smart that you did was to make them um, assisted so that you know it's a hilly area and right. and and it's it's sometimes people are like oh i can't climb that last hill up by amherst college or whatever it is and so it's like but with the with the motor assist electric assist motors it makes it so easy right exactly and you know it's funny because that was not what we were necessarily proposing or looking for um we had always uh considered having at least some electric bikes as part of the program, but we didn't think it would be entirely electric, but Bowiegan came along as like this sort of fairy god company out of nowhere, <laughs> you know, that bestowed upon us all of these electric bikes. And um, it really, it was an entirely an, a game changer. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how well we would have done without without them. That's great, great. And now it goes all the way to Springfield and the whole Pioneer Valley. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, that was the goal, really. When we started, we were um, five communities and the university. And now I think we're up to nine or 10, maybe. And, and it's you, continually growing. Mm -hmm. You just brought on another community, right? West Springfield? West Springfield just came on. Yep. East Hampton joined, Chicopee joined, I believe, Agawam. So it's, you know, it's it's exciting and exciting to be part of something and watching it grow. Um, mm -hmm. So, and again, that was, you know, a collaboration that started with a conversation in a car. Mm -hmm. I miss those days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. That's right. So we, we are coming up at the end of our half hour. I told you it goes really quick, Stephanie. Um, so I'd love to invite one last time, any, any questions from our multiple um, channels of audiences here, feel free to put that into the chats or the comment or raise your hand now. Um, but while we're waiting for that, I'd love for, you know, any calls to action that you have for people, um, our community members or things that you didn't get asked yet that you want to leave people with, especially on, on Earth Day. Sure. Yeah. Well, happy Earth Day. I can't believe I didn't start with that. But um, yes, uh, I, I think that the one thing that we are realizing, especially with our climate action plan, is that when you look at, you know, the emissions pie, if you will, in the town, the municipal sector is really small. And the university is a big piece of it, but so is the residential sector and buildings especially. So we really need to find a way for people to um, get engaged and be committed to addressing climate change sort of at the individual level. So we really are advocating for people to try to do what they can in their own homes. Um, and hopefully the programming that the Energy and Climate Action Committee will participate in or advocate for um, will, will sort of help our residents be able to do that and homeowners be able to do that and businesses as well. And how about you, Paul? Any, any last questions or thoughts from, from no, Stephanie's. I mean, I'm, I know the group is working. The ECAC has been working so hard, and I'm really excited about the uh, the level of detail they're getting into. And I think, you know, the other thing I always think about is, you know, Stephanie and the town had done this 15 years ago, right? I mean, the climate action plan that was on the forefront of what cities and towns in Massachusetts were doing. So the town has always been working in this area. It's a, it's a new phase now, but I don't, I don't, I think we still want to honor what has recognized the work that was done previously by other people. So. And it really is immense. All, all of the different um, projects and programs you have going on and grants and just it, like you said earlier, it, it needed to be a person, but maybe it needs to be five people. Who knows? But um, we appreciate the updates on yeah on all this important work. One thing I want to add was you know that and the council did uh, have this as a major goal, and what their important the important message from the council was that they wanted us to look through every I, every issue through the lens of climate action, 
and sustainability. And what's the greenhouse gas emission? You know, we're looking at Pomeroy Village. What kind of intersection? What's the greenhouse gas emission for the different options? So everything we do, and we're trying to build our budget that we're going to be presenting on May 3rd with this as part of the uh, deliverables so that we can start to practice what we preach and doing it in our own operations. Well, and I have to say that, you know, we did this 15 years ago, but there wasn't this kind of commitment as there is now. I mean, mm -hmm. they're really, and I think because there is more understanding of really what the stakes are. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, you know, a credit to you and the council and, and staff, you know, and the residents of the community who really know that this really is something we have to do. It's really an imperative. It's not really a choice anymore. Right. Well, we want to thank you for your time today, Stephanie. We know you're very busy. We hope you enjoy the rest of your Earth Day. And thank you thank for you. Um, all the updates. Sure. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Thanks. Have a nice day. Bye, everybody. Bye, all.